Okay. Part two of Flight to Heaven. Captain Dale Black. All that mattered was my date with a sleek twin engine Piper Navajo. Soon I would be in the air, soaring above the snarl of LA traffic. All my cares would be behind me, including college and its classwork and course schedules and the thankless, never-ending work of driving a truck. Once at the airport, I downshifted, careful not to ruffle anyone's feathers, careful to show proper respect, for this was sacred ground to me. This place where my dreams were on the tarmac waiting for me to climb into the cockpit and strap on the seatbelt. Ever since I was 14, I wanted to become a commercial pilot, to travel to see the world, wear the uniform, live the adventure. I wanted it all, and I wanted it bad. To get there, I needed a mentor. I was meeting with him that morning. His name was Chuck Burns. A 27-year-old commercial pilot, he had the license, the uniform, the skill, everything, and he was willing to take me under his wing. I would show up two or three times a week to help him with his work, flying throughout the state to deliver bank checks. Even though I got paid nothing for my efforts, I got to log a flight a lot of flight time. As a young pilot, that was compensation enough. Plus, it was a golden opportunity to fly in a quality aircraft and learn from an awesome instructor. I still have the logbook of those early flights. My first flight with Chuck was May 29th, 1969 in a Piper Aztec. We had become fast friends, more than friends. He had become like an older brother to me. I was first to arrive on the tarmac where the red and white Piper Navajo was parked. The Navajo was a family of twin engine planes designed in the mid 60s by Piper Aircraft and targeted for small-scale cargo operations in the corporate market. The Turbo Navajo could hold up to seven passengers plus crew and come with powerful Lycoming engines rated at 310 horsepower each. The propellers were controllable pitch, fully feathering heart cells, empty, the plane weighed a little under 4,000 pounds with a maximum takeoff weight of almost 7,000. The maximum speed was 261 miles per hour with a cruising speed of 238. Chuck and I had taken the Navajo out on the town just the night before. He and I had a double dated, he and I had double dated impressing the girls with the light lights that were spread over Southern California like a glittering array of jewels on a black velvet background. It had been a beautiful evening. No wind, no clouds, just a little haze. Chuck had taken off and landed, letting me do the flying in between. We had veered the plane over Van Nuys, or Nuz, N-U-Y-S, then over Los Angeles. Back then, there was limited air traffic control. The airspace above 3,000 feet <coughs> was more or less free to roam, and roam we did. Hollywood, Santa Monica, 
Arcadia, Pasadena. We had seen it all. And more important, we had impressed our dates. We had gotten home fairly late, so it was an early morning for both of us. The airplane had flown effortlessly, not giving a bit of trouble or raising any concerns. Even though it had been less than eight hours since our evening flight, I couldn't wait to get back into the air. It was a thrill to be alone with such an aircraft. Its sturdy workhorse function bred with a sleek racehorse form, as beautiful as it was powerful. I checked out the aircraft structure, examining everything from the wheels to the windshield. I felt like a jockey checking out the thoroughbred he was about to race, examining the legs, the saddle, the reins, everything checked out. That's when I climbed into the cockpit, I sat there a minute, just taking it all in. The dials, the switches, the smell of leather and metal, the feel of my hands gripping the controls. The feel of my dreams ready to take flight. I made a few checks, then started the engines. They coughed to life, but quickly evened out at a, at, to a strum. The propellers burst into a whirl, then a blur. The sensation of this, of that much power in your hands, it was exhilarating. I cut the engines and all that power died at the touch of a hand, my hand. It was more than exhilarating, it was intoxicating. I got out of the plane and waited near the aircraft's tail, looking over at the giant commercial jets lined up at their respective gates over at others taxiing on the tarmac. Waiting their turn to take off, my blood stirred as the roar of their massive engines launched them into the air. Though I grew up in the 60s, I was never a child of the 60s. The whole drug scene passed me by without giving me a second look. I did love a lot of music, though. Many of the lyrics spoke of drug use. Eight Miles High by the birds, for example, eight miles high, and when I touch down, these jets could fly eight miles high, literally. <laughs> I had flown pretty high myself in smaller planes. I was sure that no drug could come close to the feeling of flying that high, especially in that powerful plane, which made you feel powerful yourself. You can't imagine the feeling of taking off in one of those things, flying in one, landing one. The final approach. The stripes on the runway coming at you at over 100 miles per hour. The yelp of rubber as you touch down. The roar of the engines catching up to you. What a rush. My parents didn't share my enthusiasm for flying. They weren't any different from other parents raising kids in the 60s. There were plenty of things to work, worry about on the ground. Drugs, sex, the British invasions, and the music they brought with them. Vietnam. What parent would want to add to the list by putting their kid in an oblong box of metal and letting him take it to 40,000 feet? And besides, they had hopes that I would stay in the family business. Grandpa, who started it, was there. My dad, who started his own company with Grandpa's business, was there. My two uncles, Mom, Grandma, my brothers, and several cousins. It was just kind of expected that I would follow suit. I think they thought I would get flying out of my system someday and come down to earth, get my feet on the ground, and put my nameplate on a desk in the company office. But they saw how passionate I was about flying, how driven, and they indulged me. 
Another jet took off, its surging engines causing something to resonate within me that I can't explain. It was like hearing the most stirring music being played, everything within you reverberating to the music. And in one swelling crescendo, speaking to your soul, saying, this is what you were made for. My daydreams were interrupted by a pleasant man in his 30s who approached me, offering his hand. I'm Gene Bain. I'll be flying with you today. His handshake was firm and confident. Gene was a Fresno police officer and a friend of the company's chief's pilot. He also had his commercial license and on occasion he had flown the route by himself. He also had a good reputation as a pilot, which was important. After all, I was putting my life in his hands. Have you gone through a pre-flight and engine run-up yet? Well, not really, I said. Actually, I had and everything checked out, but I didn't want him to know. I felt too inexperienced to shoulder that much responsibility. I did warm up the engines, I confessed, and conducted the pre-flight on the exterior, but you had better go ahead and check it out yourself. We'll be twice as safe today, I thought. A few minutes later, Chuck joined Jean and me, and the three of us walked briskly to the plane that was to take us northward to Santa Maria, Colinga, Fresno, Visalia, Bakersfield, and several other stops in the state. We climbed aboard and settled into our flight positions. Gene took the pilot's seat. I took the seat next to him, the co-pilot's seat. And Chuck, the most experienced of us, sat on a temporary third seat behind us so that he could monitor our every move. The weather was calm, the sky clear, and I felt relaxed. And Gene started the engines. The propellers kicked in. So did my heart, revving in an anticipation of taking flight. As Jean taxied the aircraft toward the runway, though the calm was broken, he seemed overly abrupt and aggressive on the flight controls. I wondered what his problem was. Chuck wondered too. Though he didn't say anything, he just tapped me on the shoulder and motioned for me to change places with him. As Chuck fastened his seatbelt, we approached runway 15. We would be making an intersection departure, our usual procedure. This simply meant that instead of ta taxiing to the far end of the runway, we would leave from the terminal parking lot where the plane was, and we would take off from the place that intersected with the runway. This meant we would not use the 1,200 feet of runway that was behind us. By doing that, we saved a little time and a little fuel. We paused for necessary engine run-ups and to go through the before takeoff checklist. Gene flipped the switches and checked the gauges. I watched him go through every procedure, procedures that by now I could do with my eyes closed. All primary and secondary systems checked out. Chuck watched it all, monitored it all. If he was feeling uneasy, he didn't show it. At last, we were cleared for takeoff. Gene throttled the engines and steered the plane and toward the southeast horizon. Through the window, I caught a glimpse of a PSA a Boeing 727 taxiing a few hundred feet away. Don't get me wrong, the Navajo was a great plane, but it was dwarfed by the 727. I will be flying one of those someday, I thought, which was less of a thought and more of a vow. Words crackled from the control tower. Navajo 5-0 Yankee, this is Burbank Tower. You're clear to t for takeoff, runway 15. After takeoff, Turn right, heading 240, 
climb and maintain 3,000. Departure control will be on 124.65. Chuck spoke into the microphone. Roger, Nava Roger, Navajo 50 Yankee, clear to go. Runway 15. Right heading 240. Climb and maintain 3000 2465. All systems were go. Gene throttled to maximum takeoff power and the plane accelerated down the runway, causing it to bounce slightly. But that usually happened. What didn't usually happen was that we were suddenly airborne at an abnormally slow speed. I scanned the dials as questions raced through my mind. Why were we airborne so soon? Why would Gene take off at less than normal airspeed with the plane fully loaded with fuel and cargo? It was fuel and cargo. I said nothing. After all, he was a good pilot. I was told, and twice my age. The engines strained under the weight and the lack of lift. They seemed out of sync with each other, disturbingly so. Instead of the familiar harmony between the two engines, their RPMs gave a dissonant whine. Something was terribly wrong. I knew it. Chuck knew it. Gene knew it. Chuck barked the bone-chilling words that confirmed my worst fears. Let's land in that clear over there. He pointed toward a cemetery a few hundred yards away. I held my breath as the sight of pine trees filled the front windshield. We're not climbing, I said to myself. We're not going to clear those trees. Every muscle in my body froze. My God, we're going to crash. Chuck lunged for the flight controls. I braced myself for impact. I was 19. Okay, so that's chapter two, or part two of chapter one, Flight to Heaven. Captain Dale Black. That's all for this video. Thank you for watching.